Welcome to part 4 of my guide to video gaming history. The year is 1980 and Atari gets its first real competitor to the Atari VCS. Called the Intellivision, the intelligent television by Mattel Electronics. It was the epitome of sex appeal uh, in the early 1980s, being the Porsche of game consoles to Atari's station wagon. The game controller was great for the machine, with a sleek gold disc and keypad to play the games. The games were also light years ahead of any other machine of the time, with such games as B-17 Bomber, which would even have in-game voices if you bought the IntelliVoice add-on. The machine also would have some of the best arcade game conversions released, such as Bump and Jump, released in 1982, Cubert in 83, and Burger Time, also in 83. There was also a quirky little game called Dracula, where you got to play the Dark Lord himself. At $300, like paying £400 in today's money, it was only for those who could afford it, but for those who did, they had the closest thing to having an arcade in their home around this time. In television sold well, selling about 150,000 machines by 1981. In 1982, they also released, in the US, the Play Cable, which allowed you to download games onto your internal te in television memory, being able to store 20 simple 1K games for a $5 monthly subscription. They would then cycle through with different games each month. Light years ahead of its time, it did exceedingly well, and it was only the untimely demise of the Intellivision in 1983 during the video game crash that ended the play cable concept. In the portable world, there was the Microvision by Milton Bradley. This was actually released in 1979, and it was unique in that it allowed you to change the games via cartridges. Actually, the cartridge was the game, with the plastic sheath merely being the game's controller for you to play the game. Only 11 games was released on the machine, and it would be quickly superseded by a revolutionary new range of portable gaming. Called the Game & Watch by Nintendo, it had been designed by their best toy designer, called Gunpei Yokoi, who, through his hobby of making toys in his spare time, had brought Nintendo from being a card manufacturer of Hanafuda cards into the lucrative world of making toys. Gunpei had already released such toy hits as the Extender Hand Grabber and the Tin Can Shooting Range but with Gunpei on hand, they were determined to enter video gaming in a big way. Gunpei wanted to make a really cheap portable game toy. It didn't really matter about the graphics, just as long as the game was fun and the batteries would last, a philosophy he would use again later when designing the Game Boy. So, at the end of the 1970s, Gunpei and his department, called Research and Development One, would look at making a portable game using LCDs, usually used in calculators. Legend has it that Gunpei was commuting on a train and encountered a bored businessman playing with his calculator. This got Gunpei into thinking about using LCDs as opposed to small LEDs, in other words, small red lights that were typical of the time to use for such games by toy rivals Tomy and Mattel. The first game he released was called Ball in 1980. The game was exceedingly basic and crude and sales only steady, but it was enough to encourage Gunpei and Nintendo to continue innovating with new versions of their Game & Watch range adding more and more to the game each time. It would be here that Nintendo would design the classic cross-controlled pad and two-button setup. Also, by 1982, they'd come up with the two-screen concept shell case with the game Oil Panic. A design Nintendo would look at again when designing the DS in 2004. Arcade Goers in 1980 was spoilt for choice with a multitude of all-time classic games released, but only one would set the world alight. The experts of the time had predicted that Rally X, an overhead racer by Namco, would be the big game of 1980, but the public felt differently and they voted with their quarters for another game. That game was called Pac-Man. 
The game was invented by Toru Iwatani, and legend has it that he was sat eating pizza at a pizzeria, where he saw the classic profile of a pizza with a slice missing, and he knew that that would make a great game character. The game was almost there, but Toru felt that during testing it still was missing something. Finally, inspired by the Popeye cartoon, Toru thought it would be fun to have a special food that Pac could pick up, and like Popeye's spinach, would make Pac strong and able to eat the ghosts in the game. This gave an extra element to the game that was really fun to play and Toro knew that he'd finally made a great game. Toru named the hero character called Paku Man, after the Japanese sound when people eat, Paku Paku. So in English it would be like saying Chomp Chomp. The game was finished and originally called Puck Man, because Pack looked like a hockey puck. But Midway, who had agreed to license the game for the rest of the world, said that the name had to be changed because they could see vandalous kids all over America changing the name Puck into something else with just one stroke of a pen. Therefore, in America and the rest of the world, the game was renamed to Pac-Man. But also, the game finally had a game hero, and that meant licensing. And the, as the craze raged on, you could buy anything with Pac-Man on it, from lunch boxes to cereal packets. Pac even went on to have his own cartoon show at his height of fame. This year in 1980 also brought another classic arcade game called Defender, one of the world's first horizontally scrolling games. It was developed by Eugene Jarvis for Williams, who had recently moved from their pinball making division into this brave new world of video games. Originally, Eugene had come up with the concept of a hor horizontally scrolling asteroids game, but it still wasn't that much fun to play, although flying over the landscape was quite enjoyable. So he added Space Invaders to shoot at, and by a suggestion by Steve Ritchie, to be able to fly in either direction. Eugene now felt he was getting somewhere with the game being quite good fun, but he wanted to justify all the killing that you were doing in the game, and so he came up with the concept of actually having to rescue people. The game was born. Over in Atari, another arcade classic had been realised. Taking the vector technology used in Asteroids and Lunar Lander, they realised that 3D graphics would be quite easy to produce. One braining storm session with Ed Rotberg and co-workers and the idea for a 3D version of Tank was made. Called Battlezone, it was in essence a 3D variant of, of the game Tank by Atari, but with two controllers and great 3D visuals he knew he had a hit. Other re games released this year was the excellent Phoenix taking the Space Invader shooter mould even further with different wave levels and ender level bosses. Also this year, Ed Logg, who had created Asteroids, had come back with another classic for Atari. This time it was called Centipede, and it was a wonderful spin on the Space Invader shooter. Finally, there was Warlords, an addictive four-player variant of Pong where you must defend your castle, which still, to this day, is one of the best multiplayer arcade games around. Other games released was Carnival by Sega and Space Panic. At home, the world was being wowed by Roberta and Ken Williams' new text adventure called Mystery House on the Apple II for their newly formed company, called Online Systems, which would later become known as Sierra Online when they would move offices. With Mystery House, it is notable that the game had picture graphics as well as text descriptions, a huge technical achievement to squeeze so many pictures on such a limited space. This year in 1980 also saw the release of the Sinclair ZX80, their first real home computer. It was notable for being the first computer to break the £100 price barrier, opening up the world of computing to the general public. But with corners cut on the hardware, this ZX80, you couldn't play games because the screen would blank out every time you pressed a button. Well, I hope you enjoyed part 4 and look forward to going through part 5 where the world goes ape.